Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy any investment based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Midweek Takeaway. Today we're joined by Callum Summerton, CEO of Chill Brands. Great to have you back on, Callum. Great to see you again, guys. How are you? Yeah, very good, thanks. So just today we saw news that Chill has partnered with the Vaping Group, a leading sales and marketing agent, to launch its nicotine-free vape product in the UK market. The Vaping Group has a significant presence in UK vape stores and can access thousands of independent convenience stores, with the UK vaping market expected to reach nearly $4.5 billion by 2027. Chill Brands is optimistic about its product's commercial prospects. Following UK sales establishment, there are plans to expand into the European market, currently valued over £8 billion. Product sales are slated to start in summer 2023, including disposable devices with high puff counts that are more competitive and sustainable. Chill Brands looks forward to leading the nicotine-free vapor device market in the UK and Europe. Great news, Callum, as you gear up to target the UK market. Yeah, it, it really is. You know, we, for a long time, have been working on these vapes, kind of working on the US market. Obviously, they, they landed over there in March of this year. But I, I really can't overstate the significance of this move for us. For one thing, on a kind of an emotional level, it's very, very nice for us to have a growing base of operations in the UK where we're listed. And I think it will pay dividends once our uh, shareholders can actually see the products that they kind of own a piece of in stores that are local to them. But also, you know, th- there is a real sizable opportunity in the UK market for these sorts of products. That is the overwhelming message that I've heard since I met Mike Shaw at the Vaping Group and his his colleagues. They are very, very excited about this product. And so am I. And uh, yeah, we, we can't wait to get them out on the shelves now. So Callum, tell us a little bit about the uh, the product itself. Tell us what flavors are going to be available if you can and uh, sizes, maybe price point if it's been agreed. Uh, give us an idea. Yeah, it's a really good question because uh, actually, you know, while our shareholders would have seen some of the vapes, the ones that we've launched in the States, and we will be continuing with those, obviously, and expanding those uh, the range, you know, in both territories, the starting point for us in the UK is a little bit different. I'll start with flavors because that's an easy one to answer. I'm not going to say very much about it. You'll have to wait and see. But we are bringing the lemon devices to the UK. They have been uh, by far the most popular flavor. There's a great story that uh, that Eric Trader, one of our kind of co-founders and Neds, tells. He's out on the road. He's in one of the vape stores in Arizona, and uh, you know they they try these lemon vapes and they just they look around the room at each other, the, the people in this vape store, and they high five. And that's you know he's got a video of it, which is great to to verify. But Look, the flavors are good. You'll have to trust me on that until you can all try them. Beyond that, the devices themselves are, again, you know, we've launched with a 600 puff in the US. In the UK, we're going to be starting with a 1500 puff and extending also to a 3000 puff device. The reason we can do that is that in the UK, as a result of retained European law, the uh, Tobacco Products Directive, TPD, ultimately you cannot have a disposable nicotine containing device that has a tank size of more than two milliliters. That means that you can get around sort of 600 puffs out of it. And it's why Elf Bar and uh, all of the you know, Crystal, uh, Lost Mary, Found Mary, it's why they've all got 600 puff devices. We as a non-nicotine device are not bound by those restraints. And so we are able to launch with a larger puff count device at 1500. Again, at 3000, we're going to have five flavors coming. And, uh, you know, those devices will, will look and feel the same to, to a greater degree as the ones you're seeing out on the market today. They're going to last, you know, three times plus longer. They're also going to be at a slightly elevated price point as a result of that. And, and that ultimately means, one, our margins are obviously better than perhaps you might see with people who are in a race to the bottom on the 600s trying to sell them cheap. But two, crucially, we take ourselves outside of, and it's referenced in our RNS, the pocket money spend, which is, you know, the, the very attainable price point that school children or whatever else can go out and buy a 600 puff vape at. We cannot um, find ourselves in the same position as the vape companies that have been criticized for sort of marketing to children. We do not want to be in a position where any miners are purchasing our products. And so ultimately, by the very nature of this larger device, 
we position ourselves outside of that market, we're more socially responsible, the margin is better, and the experience for the adult vape user is better as well because, you know, the vape lasts longer than half a day because, you know, let, let's not kid around. People are puffing on these things constantly. And so a 600 puff vape, you know, how long that lasts is is up for question, but uh, it's up for grabs, but um, normally not longer than at most a day. Very good. It's an interesting one, really, isn't it? Because as the vape size or puff size increases, will that mean that somebody just goes through 1500 puffs in a day instead of 600 because that's the way these things tend to work isn't it that uh, yes it's bigger but actually does it last any longer yes it lasts longer in puffs but does it last longer in terms of when we have these things in our hands so yeah. It's, a, yeah, it's an interesting concept it's a really good question you know for the most part you know they will tend to last longer you know you you'd have to really be going for it to get through especially the 3000 devices in one day and i wouldn't advise that but at the same time it, it really comes down to you know personal preference there are going to be people out there who are already using vapes in a very very significant way we want to cater to them you know we've got some um, heavy vape users heavy nicotine users that we're finding in some of the stores in the us that we've spoken to who like to break up their habit with a zero milligram device they're already using you know um, short fills and not adding nicotine to them at least for some of their habit and the fact that we're giving them a very convenient way to um, again b break up their their day full of nicotine with a zero milligram device gives us a, a degree of a confidence that we have broad appeal both to the people at the top end of the market who are constantly on nicotine devices and also further down where people are perhaps looking for a more kind of recreational experience and aren't really interested in the nicotine at all. I must admit that the, the packaging that I've seen, obviously we, we were in the US and we received someone and I think it's always a good barometer to give your daughter, you know, your sort of teenage daughter, not, obviously not give them to them, but just let them have a look at the packaging and like that their responses were really cool packaging, looks really modern like the colors and then when you open them up and you, and you see the packaging inside and the actual kind of colorways on, on each one it's actually quite vibrant isn't it it's, it's a really nice you know palette that you've chosen for them so first impression look very good to me yeah that that's very much our intention you know you, a product lives and dies by how it looks on the shelf and you know we've therefore alongside the you know our website updates try to make our new product range look as appetizing and appealing as, as possible you know these are very pastel they're light and airy and and that is the sort of get up that we need to hit to target the you know the demographics that are buying these things so yeah i, I do think that they will have a lot of appeal and again, you know, if you look at the trajectory of the vaping market, you've gone from what used to be a hobbyist market for people who were filling up their own in tanks. You've now gotten to the sort of, you know, pile of high and sell them cheap with a lot of the 600 disposables. We want to be at the top end of that. We want product to look very attractive. We want it to sort of exude a degree of luxury, even I would suggest in that, you know, this is, this is a treat more than anything else. And uh, we, we want to make sure that people feel like when they're buying these things, it, it's not perhaps so embarrassing as filling up your bag with health bars. So I, I think probably the, uh, the question on everybody's lips is, you know, what is the potential market size in, in nicotine free vapes yep. in the UK? And, and what part of that can chill, chill brands and chill.com uh, get over the next number of years? Yeah, again, um, I think a good question, and this is really an exciting opportunity. So so what I'll say on that is the US vaping market may be the biggest in the world in terms of consumer base and revenues right now, but the UK is, to my mind, without any shadow of a doubt, the most sophisticated vaping market in the world. Here, our government has taken an extraordinarily proactive approach to the industry. We've got solid regulations. We've got trading standards doing a sterling job of holding brands to account, and that is very important. Elf Bar, at its peak, was selling 2.5 million units every single week in the UK, 130 million units a year. That was on the up until they had some PR issues quite recently. As a result of our higher puff counts and therefore our margins being a little bit elevated as well, if we sold a million units a year, We'd be looking at revenues that, you know, this company has never seen in its current guise before. You know, you know that can scale outwards from there. But, you know, that that's what I, I want to be targeting in the first place. In, in 2022, sales of disposable vapes in the UK was more than 400 million. The category keeps on rising. It was the top riser for the grocer convenience store survey in the last year. 
and you know alongside all of the buzz around how much these retailers are selling at the same time you've got the government offering free vape kits that was recent news they're going to come out and offer over a million units of vapes to people who are trying to quit cigarettes you've got nhs england and its successors saying that vaping is 95 percent safer than smoking you've got cessation programs the market in the uk is booming People are very, very interested in this category. The regulators are embracing it. We hear anecdotally as well that around a third of vape users are very interested in nicotine-free alternatives. Look, the market's there, the timing's right, and I truly believe that Chill Zero is the brand to deliver in this space. And why the hell wouldn't the NHS buy zero nicotine ones instead of ones with nicotine? I mean, we'll have to wait, have to wait and see. I'll reserve comment on that for now. But the reality is, if you're a health service, you're not going to want to continue to give people nicotine, even if it's to, to get them off. You, or you're going to want them to have no nicotine. Yeah, but T3 is an important part of the journey. You're right. I mean, it's you start with, if you look at true cessation, obviously, you know, different folks will have a different approach to this. But you start with your cigarettes or whatever your kind of chosen mode of traditional tobacco is. You get yourself onto a nicotine vape. And you slowly, slowly, incrementally reduce the milligram value of that nicotine in your product. Now, the end goal, of course, is to get yourself to not using any kind of device if you're looking at true cessation. But the key really is, look, even once you've gotten yourself weaned off of nicotine, these people for many years in in a lot of the cases have been puffing away on a cigarette or a vape in an X number of times a day. They want the oral fixation. They want something to do with their hands. They want something that keeps them occupied. And so, you know, having spoken to experts on this as well in the cessation space, you know, clinical psychologists, it is also very important for people in that sort of journey to have the option of a nicotine-free product. And so, yeah, I, I do see a space for us there too. Yep, it all sounds good. And I mean, the numbers you talked about in terms of Elf Bar, if you even managed, I mean, you're talking about a million as opposed to 130 million that they were selling, but even a reasonable percentage of what Elf Bar was selling, 15, 20% would blow the doors of what you're actually going to produce in revenue in, uh, in children. Yeah, it, it absolutely would. You know, as I say, it would be unlike anything this company in its history has actually managed to achieve. You know, with the vaping group, once we get going in the UK, once the product is, is ready to go, we're going to be opening distribution accounts with vape stores and chains. We're going to be targeting national retailers. That'll take a bit longer, but we are aggressive. We're going to be setting up online sales, outdoor advertising campaigns, events. I guess we want to make our name in this industry. We're not playing around. This is not just a pun at launching a new product. We're serious and we're coming for our share of the market. Yep. And then obviously on top of that, we've got the US. Um, you also mentioned to me that the the fastest growing vape the area in the entire world is actually the Middle East. I'm sure everybody has been to one of these cafes where you puff uh, puff through the uh, the water to to, uh, to get your shisha. And effectively, a lot of the people are being turned off by this because it's got a lot of health problems. And um, they're moving towards vapes. And uh, certainly, when I've spoken to people here in Egypt uh, to have the chance to have a vape and do this activity without having any addiction towards it in terms of the nicotine is uh, is very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you make a good point on shisha. Look, if you spend sort of 20 minutes to an hour smoking a shisha pipe in a cafe or whatever, you are inhaling the same amount of smoke as a cigarette user would having 100 cigarettes. So you know, that's, that's a stat that a lot of people would like to ignore if they have used shisha, but look, it, it's there. And um, again, going back to the NHS uh, or Public Health England rather stat, vaping is 95% safer than smoking. You know, as much as, you know, there is still research to be done, as much as people will tell you, oh, we don't know anything about it. Vaping hasn't just been around for a couple of years since the disposables took off. It's been around for, for a number of decades now. The first vapes were in the middle of the 20th century. And, and we have had health authorities and research organizations looking at it for a while. So we do know that it's better for you than putting a load of tobacco in your lungs. But I mean, look, I suppose on a, on a wider level, your question is how are we doing and how do we look to expand overseas? You know, it, things are going well in the US. It always takes time to get distribution set up. Sometimes it feels like you're banging your head against a brick wall, getting retail buyers to make the initial decisions. But we're moving. We've got new stores picking us up bit by bit. I expect the UK to be a little bit of a different story just because, you know, our new partner has tremendous access and you can touch all of the UK 
in a number of hours versus the the, the large landmass that is the US. It's a bit harder to get your spread out there. But yeah, I, I think we do have uh, legs in other areas of the world. You mentioned the Middle East. There is a huge appetite there. Um, you've got the Dubai Vape Expo coming up in, in June. And I do think that we can see a natural extension there. There's a competitor of ours in the nicotine free space. And uh, they've been, you know, there's a couple of Middle Eastern countries that make up something like a million pounds of sales a quarter for them. And they've only really just really gotten going. I think our brand is uh, significantly better as well. So the word chill is pervasive and that gives us a good shot at growing in those markets too. But yeah, I mean, I think, as I say, we, we do have very, very good prospects overseas, whether that is the Middle East, Europe, the UK, the US. And, you know, I'll, I'll be totally realistic as well. Building up a sales profile takes time. Building distribution channels takes time. The products only landed in the States, you know, in, in March, in late March. So it's been really two two months or so into operations there. I, I don't want to give people the impression that this is a walk in the park. However, it is also a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, the nicotine-free category itself is relatively new, but we're hearing from the specialist stores, the vape shops, that see these products and really know and understand them, that there's an increasing level of consumer demand for zero nicotine. That hasn't necessarily dawned on the major retailers yet, as they're typically a lot slower to uh, to act on trends, and they want to see that you've got data first before they actually you know have a, have a go at this. It takes months and, and rounds of buyer decisions to get yourself into a big box store. They're a tough nut to crack, but once you have that data, they start to fall in line. They want the product, and they come with big volumes as well. Okay, moving uh, moving on just to Chill.com. The domain, we had another product added and uh, how do we see more products going in the next uh, period of time? Yeah, so Umbo joined us. They're a great brand. They're another of these brands that's got a degree of celebrity feel uh, appeal. You've got uh, uh, founders there who were very, very you know well regarded in the UFC leagues and the NFL. And, you know, what we see in the US and it's, it's coming elsewhere too, is this real trend towards nootropics and functional mushrooms and that's exactly what they do so so they're a really good addition for us and, and we're hoping that we can obviously add traffic to the site as a result of them joining but also you know some, some sales as they pass through us yeah. chill again is a great word it's a domain that uh, when we're talking to brands they often say well that's easier to spell than our name selling on there is going to be a bit easier to market so yeah look with, with brands that are joining, I think I've said elsewhere, we will have no, or it was during our webinar, we will have no challenge in getting these brands signed up. We've got a great pipeline. We've got a lot that want to join, particularly in the beverage space, whether that's CBD, hemp, nootropics, isotonics, etc. It's a question of actually getting them onboarded. We've been doing a lot of work on our back end to make sure we can do that in a scalable way. We're obviously to a degree at the mercy of the brands themselves giving us all the insurance certificates, the the graphics, everything we need to actually make their product you know worthwhile actually having on the site. But yeah, it, it's looking very good. And what we're also doing is working with a number of category experts who act as sales agents for numerous brands and seeing if they would, whilst putting you know products onto Amazon or Walmart or whatever else, whether they would like to take their catalogue of brands rather than just one and introduce them to chill.com as well. So I think we'll be able to get some some bulk on there through that channel too. Very good. So what what is the situation then in terms of traffic? Have you seen a, a, an uptick in traffic since uh, the a few of the brands have started uh, being at on to chill.com? Yeah, we have. I mean, we've been working obviously on SEO with the Neil Patel agency, been working on email marketing. We've been growing our email list very uh substantially as a result of you know working with these brands and also contests that we've been running i think that look, our, our visits are increasing we've gone from you know sort of the the ten thousand mark when we originally launched in terms of unique visitors per month up to uh well at times we're bouncing beyond twenty thousand, and then even beyond it depending on the the pages on the site the the other thing that we're seeing i, I think there's a um I think there's a particular commentator on one of the boards who often mentions that you know 20 20 percent of people leave after being on the front page well that means that 80 percent or thereabouts of the people who visit the site are actually navigating through to other pages perusing the products possibly buying with us and uh, and that's really pretty good for an e-commerce site so yeah things are improving there they will only continue to improve as we add more brands i guess the simple metric is the more products that are on there and the more traffic that we can drive to the site, 
the more opportunities we will have to make a sale of a product that is relevant, you know, in some way or another to one of those unique visitors. So it is a, it's a continued journey. I think that we will uh, be greatly benefited by adding a greater breadth of products. And we're working on that now. We've even got some non-consumable products coming on shortly that you'll see. And so, yeah, it, it, it's a good story. It's something that over the mid to longer term, I think is highly scalable and therefore, you know, has the opportunity, the potential to generate pretty significant revenues. You know, obviously we're focused on our own products, our vapes as an immediate cash generator, but, but that marketplace in time could be, you know, massive, frankly. Yeah, I think, I think, especially in the UK anyway, once the vapes become visual in, in stores, et cetera, et cetera, then I think many people are going to order from chill.com as well. Um, so, you know, because it's just going to be more convenient, you, you would imagine anyway. Yeah, very much so, very much so. And um, I, I think the other thing that I guess is is worth saying is that ultimately, look, we're, we're taking taking the time to make sure that everything on that site works really, really well, because what we don't want is to drive a load of traffic to it and it to crash. So yes, we've been kind of taking a bit of a pause in terms of getting some brands on. It's been slower than I would have liked, certainly. That's not to say we haven't been signing them in the background, but look, we want to make sure it's robust as well. You've got to make sure you can supply demand when you're there. In this case, the demand is people having a great user experience on the site. That's what we're very, very focused on. So you know, that, that is it largely. It's, it's a case of just building outwards and, um, you know, making sure that another thing that's worth mentioning, tying the two strands together, look in the March RNS, we mentioned how difficult it is. One of the big bugbears in the vape market in the United States is actually delivering products to consumers. We've been making great progress on that. Um, you know, I think we're, we're almost in a position where we can touch all 50 states. Opening that online delivery channel for vapes will be no mean feat for us. There aren't a great many people doing it actually in the US. It's going to give a greater degree of confidence to the retailers that we're talking to on vapes, but it's also going to drive traffic to the site because then people can actually buy a vape online in the US. And while they're there, why not pick up a mad tasty drink, an umbo mushroom tincture or whatever else it is that, that's appropriate for you as the buyer? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, the penny starts to drop with the market. Obviously, we um, we first talked uh, to you, obviously, a long time ago, but um, you were recommended as one of our shares of the year at 2P. So you are um, around the 9P mark now. So you are... Um, you are way ahead in terms of uh, everybody else's performance in, a, in the portfolio. So congratulations for that. All right. and, uh, I think we've only just started, to be honest. I think uh, things are just getting going because the type of numbers that you're talking about warrant a significantly higher um, market capitalization. I, I think so. I mean, I, I guess looking at the, the history of, of Chill as a company and Zoetic before that, I guess, being frank, let's look at what's happened with the CBD market. Not many people have done very well. Set aside novel foods and marketing restrictions and all the other factors that have stopped growth in this industry, or in that industry, rather. At the end of the day, it's a very difficult area and product category. You've got a lot of retailers who've been burned by it. There's been a loss of trust across the industry. The same is true for a lot of the cannabis companies, that you know, Canopy Growth, Cureleaf, and others. It would be remiss of me not to kind of comment on that area. CBD might be the origin of the brand and it is part of the future, but we, we can't shackle ourselves to it. And I guess, you know, where this journey of growth has really originated is, you know, we've diversified. We've been fortunate enough to be one of the ones to have done it in time. There are plenty of others out there in CBD who are suffering. They can't say the same. They're either looking for an exit or being forced to face, you know, a really uncertain future. There will be consolidation. The cycle will return again. But we, in the meantime, have looked elsewhere for the opportunity and most importantly, revenue. For us, it's vapes over the longer term marketplace. CBD and cannabinoids will have their day and we will be part of that. But I think, you know, for the meantime, you're right. You know, we have a very significant opportunity in this area with marketplace, with vapes and with building the chill.com brand. Very good. I think on that note, we'll say uh, thanks very much for your time. We'll look forward to you updating the market in due course, Callum. Look forward to it. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, Callum. This podcast was brought to you by Roast PR Limited. If you would like to appear on a future episode of The Sunday Roast, please email admin at thesundayroast.net.